I should start by saying I gave a part of this talk last week in, uh, in a red state <laughs> in Indiana. Uh, it went over well. Um, but, uh, but really talking about race and structural racism um, uh, in, in communities where race is not uh, taken seriously is sometimes challenging. I think I want to start um, similarly with a story about my child. Um, Carol, I'm, I'm going to copy you. Um, about uh, the day after the election, um, I was, uh, it was, uh, I was uh, in a very difficult space. <laughs> um, and I had to teach my graduate seminar at San Francisco State University. And so um, I teach and I write largely about hope and healing communities. And I began my lecture talking about the role of hope and, and healing. And immediately my graduate student stopped me and said, you know, wait, you know, we're not feeling really hopeful <laughs> right now. And essentially we stopped the lecture, we stopped the lesson, and I, and I just sort of asked them, what's on your hearts? Now, tell me what you're feeling right now. And they cried, and they, they, they were angry, um, and they, we had a healing circle. And as we began, to, we went around the circle, and, and people were expressing how they felt, um, one of my students uh, turned to me and said, you know what, Dr. Jenright, you write about hope, and you write about healing all the time. Um, what do you do to stay hopeful in a situation like this? And it kind of struck me, right, because she was right. I write about that. But at that time, when she asked me that question, I wasn't hopeful, right? And I, whatever I said to them, I don't, I don't really remember what I said, but it wasn't honest, right? It wasn't real. Because what I wanted to say is I don't know. I'm, I'm, I don't feel hopeful right now, and I don't know what to do. Even though I teach uh, teachers or I teach youth development professionals about agency and the, and the significance of voice and power, I didn't know what to say or do. And so I sort of left class that night, and it was an um, unusually warm night in November a few weeks ago. And as I was driving across the bridge, I rolled down my window, and I got a text message from my wife. And I know you're not supposed to drive and text, but I looked at it anyway. It was my wife, man. So she said, I need you to pick up your daughter. My daughter's 15 years old. She goes to school in downtown Oakland. And I need you to stop by and pick your daughter up before you come home. And so I said, okay, no problem. And then I got a text from my daughter. And she, the text said simply, I wish I could put it up on the board. She said, it's so beautiful down here. And I didn't really know what she meant. And so as I got to downtown Oakland, uh, I parked my car on 17th. Um, and I got out um, the car and I was walking towards where my wife said she was, which was in Frank Ogawa Plaza. What I didn't know is that my daughter and a lot of her friends had walked out of school that evening, or that day, and they had participated in a significant and a large public demonstration about the results of the election. As I got out of the car, I had been to Frank Ogawa a number of times, but I heard something I had never heard before when I got out of the car in downtown Oakland. It was almost as if I had been walking up to the um, Oakland Arena or, or the Coliseum, right? It was a huge roar, like roar. And I was like, what the hell is that? And I didn't even know that there was a demonstration. And as I walked into Frank Ogawa, there was 10,000 people with candles chanting and singing and playing and, and really just building a sense of uh, beloved community. And I asked my daughter, I texted her where she was, and, and I found her. And my daughter is not an activist type like her daddy, right? Um, we began to follow the crowd in our march, and the drums were beating behind us, and people were singing, and we were walking slowly down the street, and she turned to me and said, Dad, this is going to be a beautiful struggle, and I'm in it. When she said that, I was immediately hopeful again. And what I knew from, from that, I get emotional just thinking about it, is that something that she learned in her school or something that she learned in her after school programs or something that she learned in her parents gave her a sense of agency to confront and address the inequality in our society that we know is going to be exacerbated in the next four years. And that it wasn't just my struggle in my generation, right, but it was her struggle too. 
And she was with her friends, and they were texting and selfieing and doing all the things they do as we marched together. It became her struggle as well. And I was hopeful again. And I think that oftentimes, when we talk about inequality, um, we forget that sometimes we need to begin to understand that we may not see the end of the issues that we're trying to address, but we need to be imagining those ends three generations from now, right? And that means that we have to think about our programs and our strategies in a different way. And that sometimes we lose focus or sometimes we focus too much on the strategy, right? We focus too much on the program. We focus too much on the, on the precision of youth development without thinking more, more broadly about the environment. And oftentimes, um, I think, in our programs, we focus on transactional relationships with young people as opposed to transformational relationships with young people. And transactional relationships simply say, as a youth development worker or as a teacher or as a principal, my interaction with you is a function of my title. But in a transformational relationship, it means that I know you differently, right? And it means that I love you and I trust you and I have hope for you. And I think in our youth development work, right, that we have to begin to foster those types of transformational relationships with young people. A week after that happened, I was in Sacramento working with a group of teachers. And the teachers told me that sometimes it's hard, Dr. Jenneri, to form and function and foster transformational relationships with young people when we're hurting too, when sometimes we are fearful, right? That we need a space of hope and healing so that we can build that capacity to transform the lives of young people. And so when we talk about inequality, I think that sometimes we begin to talk about inequality with a set of myths, right? And those myths sometimes make it much more difficult for us to really confront inequality in ways that transform it. And the, there, I think there's three myths about inequality that if we were able to discount, we would move the dial on building more equitable strategies in our programs and in our society. And the first myth is that inequality can be addressed by focusing on diversity. That means that if we, if we only focus on sort of making, focusing on difference, by focusing on bringing a more racially diverse staff or, or a, a staff that uh, has different gender orientations, while that's necessary, it's still insufficient because diversity doesn't confront the very structure of inequality in our society. It doesn't confront the ways in which the systems are in place that create suffering and misery in many of our communities. The second myth is that we can achieve equity by focusing on youth resiliency, or in the most recent form is social emotional learning. And again, while social emotional learning is, is important and significant, it takes place in a context. Social emotional learning takes place in neighborhoods and it takes place in schools and they place, take place in classrooms and families that somehow, sometimes are under-resourced. And so we have to begin to think about not only um, uh, achieving equity by focusing on youth resiliency or sometimes a specific strategy, but we have to ask questions about the environment in which the, these practices take place. And thirdly, um, I'm gonna make some people angry in here, that brain science can help us address inequality among youth of color. And the reason I use the term brain science is largely because there's, a, there's, a, there's an enormous amount of research that I think is useful in us understanding the consequences of stress, the consequences of poverty on the development of young people's brains and healthy development. And I think that's necessary. But my question is, is despite the fact that we may have strategies that, that, that allow for young people to heal or, or, or for them to uh, be more resilient, we still are not addressing the fundamental causes of harm in the first place. So these are the three myths that I think we need to 
take into consideration in our youth development programming and in our strategies, right? And so the truth is, is that if we don't focus or if we don't take into consideration issues such as structural racism, right? The ways in which race is structured in our society that creates inequality for young people of color. If we don't take that in consideration and build the capacity of young people to confront structural racism, in some ways we're reproducing inequality, right? The second is implicit bias, right? And those are the fundamental ways in which we think about race. There's a, there's a way in which we believe that when we are adults, we're finished developing, right? But we're not done, right? And so when we talk about implicit bias, it's how are we having conversations in our, in our staff development, in our professional development? How are we having conversations about race and our own implicit bias in an honest way, right? The only way to confront inequality around implicit bias is first recognizing that bias that we have, right? If you think about structural racism and implicit bias, structural racism is sort of the table. Implicit bias are like the legs that hold that table up. And so once we begin to acknowledge implicit bias, the fundamental beliefs we have about young people of color, then we can begin to erode these the structures that create their, 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 their suffering and their, their harm. So there are some examples of structural racism and implicit bias I want to go, I want to share with you. And then in my most recent research, we also did an exam, we looked at some programs, and I'm going to share one program with you in Tucson, Arizona, that I think provides a model for us to look at how they're supporting young people with confronting structural inequality um, or structural racism and implicit bias in their school district, right? Um, this is an example. If you look at the red numbers, these are African-American young people. These, these are statistics uh, by the U.S. Department of Education that African-Americans represent, or African-American students represent roughly 16% of the enrolled students in the United States, but they represent 42% of the suspensions and 34% of the expulsions, right? So one might conclude that African-American students are simply more disruptive or harder to control in class. Or one might conclude that there's something going on fundamentally with the way in which we're preparing teachers to deal with classroom discipline. This second map is um, looking at, which uh, this map was done um, at the University of Pennsylvania, that looks at the disparities in suspensions among African American students. Again, sort of the blue numbers represent the African American students enrolled in these states, and the red or orange numbers represent the percentage of African American students that are suspended. Right? Um, if you look at the, uh, in, in 84 of the school districts in those states, uh, 84 of those school districts, 100% of the students that were suspended were African American, right? So again, we have to look fundamentally, right? Is it that African American students are somehow more disruptive, or is it something fundamental about the ways in which race is shaping the ways that teachers and education responds to students of color? These ingredients of inequality, structural racism and implicit bias, create what James Gabarino in his, in his research calls social toxicity. And social toxicity is similar to physical toxins, right? If you think about asbestos or lead paint, that if you're exposed to it over time, it'll make you sick. And if you don't heal from it, it could become lethal. So James Gabarino says that in some ways that structural racism and that implicit bias, that ex overexposure to it <laughs> uh, overexposure to it has uh, an, a, a, a toxic impact on pe young people's well-being, right? Um, this is an example of social toxicity. Walking to school, uh, sort of concerned about the ways in which police are going to support you or not. Another example is immigration, right? And my, my brother, my sister, my father, going to be deported, right? All of these things create an enormous amount of stress that research suggests has a ne negative impact on the well-being of young people, right? So the question becomes, um, the strategies that we oftentimes use to address these are simply misdiagnosed. And as um, I spoke last time at this conference about some of the challenges with the current formulations of social-emotional learning. The question that we should be all addressing 
is how is social emotional learning and how are those strategies designed to address issues of structural racism and inequality, right? And this, um, uh, the sort of gold star here is sort of character development. And there's a number of terms that we use, right? Character development and social emotional skills and cognitive development and a growth mindset, all of them are really suggesting, right, that there's something that we could do with young people's effort, all right, there's something that we could do with their individual effort to achieve a sense of well-being and purposefulness. But there are some challenges with that, and I'm going to go over those quickly because Stacy said I have one minute left, right? <laughs> right? Um, the first is that, that there's a focus on the individual as opposed to the collective. And so that what young people experience, young people of color don't experience racism in an individual way, right? What has happened last summer around police violence and police shootings wasn't individual. These are collective experiences, right? The second is effort versus opportunity. That our current formulations of character development focus on this sense of effort, that if young people develop these skills, that if young people have these traits within their own individual uh, effort, that they can achieve a sense of opportunity. But the fact, of, is, the fact is, is that we also have to look at the opportunity structure in neighborhoods and schools. And then the third is skill versus power, right? S that these skills, social emotional skills, are again significant, but what's also important is that young people have the power to engage and have voice to the conditions that they face in their schools and neighborhoods, right? So the process that, that we're gonna look at really quickly is called radical healing. And the research that I did I found that schools and youth development programs that use this process called radical healing are able to get young people to develop a socio-political critique and action in the, in the systems that they participate in, like schools and after school uh, programs. But the, these programs give young people a voice and give them the skills to actually address those issues that they need, that they see in their schools and communities. Um, the radical healing is a both Co uh, collectively healing from exposure to harm, but it is also transforming the policies and rules and regulations and those institutions that are causing the harm in the first place. So there's, there's five principles to radical healing that I found in a number of programs, one of which I'm gonna briefly share with you, Stacy. just 30 seconds, right? Um, um, first is a saturating young people with a sense of identity and culture, right? Who are you as an African American? What does it mean to be Latino? What does it mean to be an immigrant? What does it mean to be Chinese? So, so to provide young people with opportunities to explore culture and identity. The second is agency, right? I'm sorry, I can go through this. Uh, is, the, is giving young people a sense of action to change um, their personal and social conditions, right? How are we providing a sense of voice and a skill set so young people can confront things like we want more police officers in our schools as opposed to books, right? Giving young people the skills to organize and give them voice around those issues. The second are relationships, right? To foster and maintain strong interdependence and connection with others. And this really means that we need to begin to shift from transactional relationships, who I am as a teacher and who you are as a student, to transformational relationships. And I give, as a rule of thumb, you know you have a transformational relationship with someone when you know what they're going through and when you know their children or you know their wives or their partners, right? And those are the kind of relationships that we need to begin to foster in our programs and schools. And I know that our professional development tells us that we cannot transgress our professional, right? Particularly for therapists and social workers, that we have to maintain that distance. But in the conditions that we're talking about, those are insufficient, right? The kinds of relationships that we need to have with young people are, have to be transformational, knowing that I have to be able to understand the conditions that you're going through. Yes. Thanks, Stacy. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so she gave me a little bit more time, so I'm gonna move forward. Right? <laughs> Fourth is meaning, right? The ability to live and lead from a purpose of direction of fulfillment, right? Sometimes we've forgotten why we got in this damn work in the first place, right? So how are, we, how are we reminding ourselves, what the teachers in Sacramento taught me, is that we need to focus on our own sense of well-being as youth development providers in, dealing in, in these kinds of issues, forming support groups and conversations about the meaning and the fulfillment that we have in this work we do. My teacher just, or my student just yesterday, 
I'm sorry, I'm taking more time. But I'm, she said to me, she said, uh, Dr. Jenright, um, uh, the work that you do as a professor and as a youth development and uh, 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 as youth development professional training is a sacred work, right? It's sacred, meaning that it imprints on other people's lives. And what that did for me is it gave me a sense of meaning. It made me see my work as not just something that I do from nine to five, but that it has the ability to have generational impact. And then the, the last is a sense of aspirations, right? And the aspirations come from the research on hope, right? That's, that young people need to be able to see beyond the conditions in which they live, right? They need to have a sense of hope and purpose, and this aspirations allows for young people to begin to envision the kind of schools, envision the kind of communities and neighborhoods in which they want to live. This is also important for our, our own sense of well-being as youth workers, right? So this is an example of, of, of a radical healing process in Tucson, Arizona. So in Tucson, Arizona, uh, 58,000 students, uh, about 61% uh, of those students were Latino, um, 26 are Anglo. The, the Latino students had the highest dropout rates, the highest number of, of failure rates, um, highest suspensions in the district, right? A colleague of mine named Julio Camarota went to Tucson at, with the University of Arizona and said, let's institute a uh, ethnic studies program. Um, California just now, I just read a couple days ago that California is now uh, spreading ethnic studies programs throughout California. So he wanted to in implement an ethnic studies program and what they wanted to do was give young people a sense of their cultural and racial identity. They wanted to give them a sense of voice Right? so that they can speak out about the issues that they see. They, they fostered profound transformative relationships. Right? They went to their homes. They went to their birthday parties and quinceaneras. They, they spent time with them. And they also gave young people, uh, uh, saturated young people, the idea that their education has meaning beyond just their degree. And they allowed for young people to see beyond their per current conditions. They used these five principles of karma. Right? As a result of, a, of two years of work, right, this is what they were able to do. They actually inverted, inverted the achievement gap, right? And so if you look at their math scores, the participants, MA, um, the MAS stands for Mexican American Studies, um, and non-MAS stands for the students that didn't participate, and these are, these are largely Anglo students. And so they had a 25% increase in their standardized testing in math, 25 or the 26% increase in their uh, reading and a 20% increase in terms of their, their writing. They actually inverted that the Latino students actually outperformed the white students in that school district. Um, this is the same example, right, that this is the graduation rate, right? The Mexican American students, uh, which is about uh, at this time in 2010, it was about 400 students, right? They had a higher graduation rate than the, student, than the white students in the district. Now, we all probably are familiar what happened with that. As a result of that program, the governor outlawed ethnic studies in the state of Arizona, right? And, they, and um, despite this evidence, and it was a fight and an, it, that where young people were organizing for, 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 if you want to see more, there's a documentary called Precious Knowledge that really, really documents this, this fight. Um, they, they fought the governor and they lost, right? But what remained is the sense of agency that young people learned from participating in these types of programs, right? So there are some strategies that I want to quickly go over, just five strategies you can think about in, in, in sort of bringing these strategies into your own work and your own program. The first is a question about your board of directors, because I've done too many trainings um, and only had those trainings around diversity be sort of undercut by a board of directors who sort of, sort of who sets the direction for the organization. So first, has your board of staff uh, engaged in a quality conversation about race and structural racism? Right? Second, does your organization have a strategic plan to address inequality in any form through the lens of your organization's mission? Um, do you hire staff that represents the identities of young people that you serve? Do you, do, your, um, do, your, uh, form, do you have do your form reflection groups to learn and dialogue and engage about race and racism as staff development? And have you provided young people for opportunities to develop their identities and to heal from these instances of racial violence, right? All of these are sort of strategies you can consider and think about as steps, sort of micro steps 
uh, to begin to build a racial justice in your own organization. Right? I want to end with this quote by Michelle Alexander, who is a long, who's probably written the most significant piece of research on structural racism um, uh, in, in recent times. And she is a legal attorney who wrote the book The New Jim Crow. And Michelle Alexander, in, in June of this year, um, her, she's a lawyer her entire life. She said she's not going to practice law anymore. And she said I'm not, she's not going to practice law anymore because that there are more fundamental questions that we're grappling with as Americans, right? And she says that the problems that we face are not simply legal problems or they're not political problems or policy problems. At its core, America's problems raises profound and spiritual questions about who we are, about what we aim to become, and what we're willing to do about it. Right? And so I want to leave that charge with you, right? that there's some one way that you could leave and implement some form of racial justice in your programs in the next seven days. Right? Because if we don't, right, we're going to enter an environment that's going to be increasingly difficult, and we need everyone at the table. Thank you.